But I'm going to exaggerate some differences to make a point. Um, I reserve the right to be more reasonable under questioning. Yeah? So there are some extremely strong differences between systems thinking and complexity thinking. And those of us in the complexity thinking field get deeply distressed when systems thinkers try and subordinate our language. So I'm going to heavily emphasize that one as we go through. I also wanted to start off with this slide. This comes from Hugh. If you don't know Gapin Void, you can subscribe to his website and get one of these cartoons every day. If it wasn't for that and Dilbert, I would go insane. Right? Um, this actually makes a very important point that pathways up are different, pathways down are the same. And it's really a strong argument, and I will emphasize this throughout today, against trying to imitate what other people have done on the assumption you can get the same result. And we've seen disasters on that in the development community over the years. For example, the Grameen Bank, which evolved over 30 years in a specific culture, and people try, try and take the self-reported endpoint of a 30-year evolutionary process and replicate it, and of course they don't get the same results. Yeah? I'll talk later about some of the work we're doing with UNDP to identify how can you identify the starting conditions on an empirical basis. So you can define which projects are starting in the right place rather than trying to replicate outcome. Yeah? But the point, and it's emphasized by this, is any pathway up in development is going to be different from what other people have done. And this attempt to constantly imitate success is actually quite dangerous and also, as you'll see, it's very bad science. It's compounded by this from a friend of mine. I love this phrase, Gladwellism. Uh, the hard sell of a big theme supported by dubious, incoherent, but dramatically <laughs> presented evidence. Um, cognitive neuroscientists have, write whole, have to write whole books to try and counter the idiocy of Blink yeah, and its selective use of data. No? But actually, the development community, again, has become very susceptible over the last few years to management fads. In fact, as industry realizes their inadequacy, consultants come and sell them into government. In fact, there's an old adage in consultancy where you can't sell it to industry anymore because they know it doesn't work. Go and sell it to government because you'll get another 10 years of life cycle and you can claim it's industrial best practice. <laughs> so just as the pharmaceutical industry is abandoning double-blind trials because they know they don't work, guess which sector takes it up? and a field where actually it's inherently impossible for them to work given the nature of human society. So this fadism is, is a major danger and we need to get a more scientific type approach. So, the approach I've adopted over the years, and it's beyond crude empiricism, I'm not sure of the reason for the leopard, but I took it last weekend in Kruger and I'm proud of it, so I, I want to show it off, all right? Give me another couple of keynotes, I'll have a very coherent story about why the leopard is important, all right? Um, and that was taken from 20 meters away, so I'm quite pleased with that one. Um, if you actually look at what happens, there's this empirical approach, and it's an empiricism based on Newtonian concepts of causality. So the assumption is you go and study 10 successful development projects, and you identify things that they did in common. Everybody familiar with this approach? And you see that the project managers of all of the projects had regular bowel movements. So, from now on, you actually select project managers on the basis of observation of their toilet habits and say that therefore things will be successful. Uh, this is called the confusion of correlation with causation and it's an endemic problem in the social sciences and the development sector in particular. So if you're dealing with inherent uncertainty, you can't afford to take that type of approach. You're not going to get repetition. The approach I adopted some time ago, also known as praxis, is to go into cognitive neuroscience, complexity theory, and say, what does this teach us about systems and people? And how can we apply that properly grounded knowledge in practice? Because if you understand theory, you can cope with uncertainty. It's a difference between a recipe book user and a chef. A recipe book user is fine as long as they've got all the right ingredients in the right kitchen and you don't mind a competent but not brilliant project. If you actually want somebody who can cope with whatever you happen to have lying around, you need a chef. A chef has practical wisdom learned over years, and they have theoretical knowledge so they can change the circumstances as they go. And that's called praxis. And what myself and other people are now arguing for in social science is we need to move away from a Newtonian model, acceptance or rejection of the Newtonian model, and shift into a different model of research, which is basically bringing the natural sciences into play 
because of the level of insight we got from that. So in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, that means a few key things. First of all, sustainability is not about imitation. Sustainability is about creating something unique. We're doing work at the moment on macroeconomic regeneration in six Colombian cities. And what I keep saying in Colombia is you mustn't try and create a Colombian Silicon Valley. Because all that will happen is people will want to go to the real Silicon Valley in the States. You need to create entrepreneurial activity which stays in the townships, which doesn't seek to leave them. Yeah? And that's actually a key important principle. You know, Colombia needs to look south to Latin America, not north to North America. Imitating the last imperial power is always a mistake because you never do it as well as they do. Creating something unique to your own culture is critical, and again, that's part of what we're trying to achieve here. Secondly, and this to me is vital, who owns the interpretation owns power. The work we're doing, which I'll explain in a minute with SenseMaker, is to pass the power of interpretation away from the expert and to the respondent. So in Ethiopia, we've got young girls who've been subject to various forms of sexual abuse, who are actually now acting as field ethnographers to gather stories from people in their community at risk using iPads. And the interpretation of that story is owned by the people who told it, not by an expert in Washington. And that transfer of the power of interpretation and narrative, to my mind, is key, because actually who possesses the narrative is one thing, but who actually owns how to interpret it that's where the real power comes. Right? So the transfer of power of interpretation is important, both on ideological grounds, but also on scientific grounds. Then we move into systems. I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but critically the concept of enabling constraints. Again, I'll explain this in complexity terms, but in a complex adaptive system, without some type of constraint, no evolution happens. The issue is what are the constraints and do they enable growth or do they restrict growth? And there's a big difference between enabling constraints and governing constraints I'm going to talk about in a minute. And by now, some of you will realize in philosophical terms, and just to make it clear, my first degree is a joint honors in philosophy and physics, which gives me a philosopher's delight of argument and a physicist's contempt for social sciences, and you're going to see that coming through. Um, basically, I'm taking a realist and a pragmatist approach, and critically arguing against atomistic interpretations. It was interesting in Peter's keynote yesterday to see the anthropomorphization of systems because that dominant philosophy of North America and Northern Europe, which assumes that all societies are aggregations of individuals and all actors are individuals, comes through so pervasively in systems thinking because that's where it came from. If you actually take the perspective I come from, which is a tribal culture in the Celtic fringe or Southern Europe or Africa, their identity is defined by your interactions, not by yourself. And cognitive neuroscience is now backing up that interpretation over an atomistic one. So actually, it's the connections between things which are more important than the things themselves. And managing connectivity is one of the key ways that we can achieve growth in a novel or different way. As long as we focus on the individual, we will actually get very little change, or we'll just get more and more selfish individuals. Yeah, and you can see that happening all over at the moment. So that's a, a key aspect of what we're talking about here. Uh, we need to create sensor systems in advance of need. This is another major problem in the development sector because there are so many projects going on in poor areas of the world. How you ever create a causal link between one project and an outcome is dubious. Again, the issue is to actually have sensor mechanisms in place which are giving you feedback continuously in real time. And this is not big data, to come back to yesterday it's actually human sensor networks which feed back in real time. Because you need human interpretation, not just text which <coughs> computers interpret. And I'm going to talk about how to do that as well. Then we get this need to manage in the tail of distributions. Everybody is managing to the center of a bell curve, a Gaussian distribution. These days, if you get any type of disease, if you actually have symptoms which match the center of a bell curve, you'll get the right treatment. God help you if you're in the tail. Because everything has been managed to averages, and you see the same thing in the development community. In reality, the tails are thicker than we think. They're Pareto distributions, not Gaussian distributions. Opportunity and threat lies in the tails in the outliers, which actually means our research methods have to make outliers visible, not eliminate them. 
And that actually undermines a huge amount of current research in the development sector, which is always trying to focus on the middle of a distribution, which is actually not where the opportunity or threat comes from. And this is just 101 statistics. Yeah? And then finally, we need to switch from trying to anticipate the future to doing what's called triggering anticipatory awareness. So, for example, in social work at the moment, we're actually shifting social workers over to keep their field notebooks in a micro-narrative system, the thing I'm going to talk about later, which gives us the type of data so that if a social worker interviews a kid at risk, the kid tells a story, interprets their own story, it goes over a threshold level which says stay in this house and ask some more questions. We don't try and forecast that a child will be abused. We trigger an anticipatory alert based on learning over time to say, look at this problem more closely. We're doing the same thing at the moment on premature discharge of patients from hospitals because that's a similar type of problem. It's, it's what Jim March famously called the problem of samples of one or less. You've got few, so few examples in the past which replicate the present that you can't forecast accurately, but you can trigger what are called anticipatory alerts. And this is going to be important for a new distributive model of donors starting to actually trigger alerts to donors when there's something that they might give money to, but not to tell them what it is. Starting to trigger alerts when a project is starting to go wrong or there's early evidence of corruption. And again, that comes, a lot of our work came from counter-terrorism and counter-narco, so you can see that sort of coming in. So that's kind of like an overview of what I want to argue for as I go through this. So, key principle here, and this is what complexity is about, it's also known as sense-making, but this is a naturalizing approach to sense-making which contrasts strongly with that of Carl Weick, both within the sense-making tradition, but this one is different. Yeah, it's, it's naturalizing. It's myself, Klein, and others. And basically, it says, how do I make sense of the world so I can act in it? And with that comes the concept of sufficiency. I can never know enough to actually produce a predictive deterministic model. So the issue is, how do I know enough that I can take some type of action? So, for example, with the UNDP at the moment, we've just run the first test on this. We did a big meeting in New York, brought in a whole bunch of scientists. We identified nine factors which can be measured which actually identify a good starting position. We've now got people submitting bids where they can't see what those conditions are with an aim to automate the early allocation of small sums of money so that something can become visible without it having to be politically correct or well-connected with objectives. And that's kind of like where, where this stuff is starting to go. It's sufficiency of data in order to act. So, in nature, there are three types of system. Complex, compl ordered, complex, and chaotic. An ordered system, and I'm using here the constraint-based definition uh, from Gerardo and others. In a com an ordered system, the level of constraint is so high, they're governing constraints, that all behavior is fully predictable. And human beings are the only species that have learned how to do this. It's unique to humans. Well, granite rocks might possibly qualify, but yeah, the stability is very high. So, for example, in a hospital these days, they count the number of surgical instruments left at the end of an operation, and they check they're the same number as were there at the start. As I get older, I think this is of increasing importance. You do not want to know how many surgical instruments were left in people's bodies before they did this. It's a very scary figure. Yeah? The trouble is, having worked out this is a good thing, we then carry it to excess. And the development sector is particularly prone at this. Everybody wants an ordered outcome. As a result of which, what happens, the informal networks grow, and behavior has to take place to make the result look like it happened, even if it didn't. I know a poor guy in Ghana who is still moving roundabout pumps into villages because otherwise he won't get his money. He knows they won't work. It was obvious they wouldn't work the first time around. But unless those are actually implemented in at least X hundred villages, further grants won't come. We're forcing people into deviant behavior. Look at government procurement. There's an old adage in the IT industry, if you didn't write the RFI, why are you bidding for it? The same is true in the development sector. You look at an RFI, you know who it's designed for. Because people are having to work around the system because the system is over-constrained. Yeah? So nothing wrong with order, but only within boundaries. Then we get a chaotic system. Now, there's no single agreement on language here, so we all have to define our terms. I'm defining chaos in the sense of randomness, i.e. the absence of constraints. 
Now, if that happens accidentally, it's a crisis, and what matters is who imposes constraints first. Detecting a crisis first gives you power. Only catching up later, it's too late. But used deliberately with purpose, it's hugely powerful. It's one that is a space for innovation. If you can create an area without constraints for a limited period of time, complete novelty happens. But it's very, very difficult to do. It's also used in what's called wisdom of crowds. So, for example, when an American submarine grounded off the coast of Portugal in the 1960s, uh, it didn't sink. I was corrected on that by an admiral just down the road here. He pointed out submarines are meant to sink. I learned from that if anybody has stars on their shoulder, let them humiliate you in the first 10 minutes of a presentation, then they might listen to you thereafter. So either way, it grounded, which means it couldn't come up again. They gave partial data, note that partial data, to a diverse group of experts around the world, didn't let any of them know who the other experts were. None of them got the position right, but the average of all of the experts was 150 meters away from the submarine. Now, there are solid statistical and cognitive science reasons why this works. We're now building sensor networks of huge volumes of, of people like our, my girls in Ethiopia, like the respondents in the streets of Colombia, which allows us to ask questions and get results back in real time to produce a whole new approach to evidence-based policy under conditions of uncertainty, something which incidentally has the potential to replace market research completely, and we're now starting more controlled experiments on that. So chaos has value. And then you get a complex adaptive system. This is one where the constraints are partial, but get modified by behavior. So the two co-evolve. As one changes, the other changes. Now, anybody here got teenage children? Right, you know about co-evolution. You also know about irreversibility. You can't say when they hit 14 and you realize there's something you shouldn't have done 14 years and nine months ago. You know, you can't call it the consultants, you know, I'd have a complete reassessment of your child rearing strategy, identify key performance indicators and a mission statement for your family. I get scared about this. I satirized this in the States last year, and somebody told me there is an industry in the States to create mission statements for families, but let's not talk about excessive perversion. <laughs> yeah. The reality is where you are is where you start from. You never, ever get a greenfield site in a development. You're always building on people's memories of the past and their perception of the present. And everybody who tries to do a greenfield site, whether it's IT procurement or anything else, has fundamentally got it wrong. In a complex adaptive system, you deal with the evolutionary potential of the present. Imagine if you can a table. Around the table, there are magnets. In the middle of the table, there are iron disks. If all of the magnets keep the same polarity and the same strength, the iron disks will form a stable pattern. If I change one of the magnets, the iron disks will change in a predictable and repeatable way. In systems thinking, which has dominated the last 30 years, that's called a driver. And everybody wants to know what the drivers are of behavior, because they want to be able to pull a lever and get a predictable result. The trouble is, if it's a complex adaptive system, all of the magnets are changing continuously, and sometimes in polarity. So you never, ever get the same situation occurring except by accident. And we call the magnets modulators. So a complex adaptive system is modulated, it's not driven. And critically, what that means is that actually there is no causality in a conventional sense. Again, a disagreement I would have with Peter yesterday, Peter kept talking about causality and the system driving things. From a complex systems point of view, that's bad science. Yeah, there is no linear causality in a complex adaptive system. The system has propensities, things which are features of it, which are difficult to change, and it has dispositions, which are the current state of affair. So let me go back to my UNDP project. We're actually measuring the propensities of the project, and then we continuously model the dispositions to see whether it's going in the right direction. So you manage the starting conditions and then monitor for emergent behavior downstream. And that requires a real-time feedback loop. So the Canavian framework from that looks like this. Um, it divides order into two, obvious and complicated. In an obvious space, there are rigid constraints. It's totally inflexible. It's the domain of best practice. And the reason is everybody can see what the right thing to do is. 
So, for example, if you're in a civilized country, you know you drive on the left-hand side of the road. There's no argument about it. Yeah? Um, we accept it as a convention because it makes sense. If you're in Italy, by the way, it doesn't matter at all. Um, Italian drivers south of Naples actually work off flocking behavior, fly to the center of the flock, match speed, avoid collision. And I do not joke, it's been studied. And I've driven the Olfini coast, I've seen it in reality. Right? But the point about obvious is we accept an approach because it makes sense, it's economical to do so. On the other hand, if it's complicated, it's not obvious what the right thing is to do, we have to do analysis. But there's still causality. This is a domain of wireframes. It's a domain of outcome-based stuff. All of that works here because it's possible to discover the right thing and the level of constraint is sufficient, we get repetition. But then we move into a complex phase. Here we have enabling constraint which actually means all practice is emergent, it's always unique, but I can measure the propensities, I can measure the dispositions to see where it's going. And then we get a chaotic system where actually there's no constraints whatsoever, so anything which emerges there is completely novel or different. Now, Kinevin has a fifth domain called disorder. That's the central bit, which is the domain of not knowing which of the domains you're in. And the radical idea here, and it is so radical, I still have to explain it a hundred times to people, is that there are different ways of doing things based on the type of system. For the last 30 years, we've been trying to create a universal approach. It doesn't matter whether it's business process re-engineering or anybody can put across Six Sigma yet. You know, I call it Six Stigma. You know, business process re-engineering with the worst aspects of American Bible Belt fundamentalism added on to it for good measure. You know, it's a cult, and the high priests of the cult get different colored belts according to their cult status. If they're given a black belt, they're exempt from doing any real work so they can impose cult discipline on those who do. Um, if you don't know the story, 3M abandoned it in all bar core manufacturing because it was destroying their capacity to innovate. But guess who's, who people are selling it to now? Government and the development sector. And anybody who associates Six Sigma with Lean doesn't understand Lean. Lean is about eliminating the waste that techniques like Six Sigma create in the first place. Yeah? So again, in a complex adaptive system, we've got to deal with it differently. And the danger is we actually want one approach. Yeah, learning organization did the same thing. Blue Ocean Strategy did the same thing. All of them claimed an approach which should be universal rather than realizing they'd come up with an insight which was particular to a context. And that's what Kinevin does. It says different approaches are valid. It's critical to know the boundary. And the boundary between obvious and chaos is shown as a cliff because if you fall over that, if you assume that things are actually, there's best practices possible, yeah, in certain circumstances, you actually become complacent, you fall over the edge into chaos. If you assume repetition, repetition is impossible, it's a mistake. Yeah. Now again, that's important to realize because complacency is actually very dangerous. But fundamentally, Kinevin is about dynamics. The normal switch should be that dynamic switch between complex and complicated. As things emerge in the complex space, you increase the constraints, you see if the constraints bite. If they do, you put them in place in higher terms because you want to make it complicated because then you can scale it. If they don't bite, you pull back and try again, which is that shift into what's called failed, safe to fail experimentation rather than fail safe design. Multiple small parallel safe to fail experiments in terms of the way things work. So kind of like, that's cool, that's a good dynamic, you want to relax the constraints every now and then. Occasionally you may need to do a reset, a shallow dive into chaos because you've allowed pattern entrainment in terms of the way people think. And a small amount of material goes down there because it goes there to die, not because it doesn't have any value, but because you don't need to change it. If something has become inflexible, unchanging, and it's legitimate, establish best practice. Oh, and if you don't know it, the human brain imprints failure faster than success. If you actually look at every story challenging tradition in the human race until Hollywood got hold of them, they're negative, dark stories. They're stories about what you shouldn't do. And as I said yesterday in one of my questions, I argue the whole move to define ideal future states is unethical as well as impractical. Because trying to tell people what sort of behavior they should exhibit is just a new form of neocolonialism. Actually, we can teach people about failure, but that allows them to emerge into a new space which is more sustainable for their culture. So actually, worse practice systems have more value in development than best practice systems, and people will spend more time listening to them. Yeah, this is just 101 cognitive neuroscience again. 
but it's amazing how people have forgotten that. The trouble is we've got too many engineers. And engineers believe in building bridges based on design principles with clear objectives. Well, some engineers, yeah? Uh, well, actually, if you didn't know it, you know the, the two university departments with the highest degree of Asperger's syndrome? <laughs> Economics and finance. Yeah? And computer science, which kind of like tells you a few things. Right? <laughs> okay, so basically, it's all about managing the constraints or flexing the constraints, but we need to have a way of understanding when we should do that in what way. <coughs> the other big danger we got with complexity at the moment is this. This lovely quote from Eliot. There are a whole bunch of people who love the language of complexity, but actually they don't want to change the way they think. Yeah? And actually quite a few of the popular books on complexity, if you look at it, they're methods which have been propounded 20 or 30 years ago before the science came out. They just subordinate in the language but not change it. Yeah? Complexity, non-causal systems require you to think in a very different way. And the minute you have causal models, you basically haven't got it. So. What we need to do is a shift to what's called abductive research. Deductive, if A, then B. Inductive, all the cases of A have B associated with them. Works for a complicated domain. Abductive, the great contribution of American philosophy to logic, is what's the most plausible connection between two apparently unconnected things? Because actually, that's where innovation happens. That's where novelty happens. And the good news is we all evolve to think abductively, not inductively. We're very good at making connections between apparently unconnected things, which is also why we fall for conspiracy theories and cults. Yeah, there's a downside as well as an upside in terms of the way it works. I had to unfollow several people from Facebook yesterday because they were perpetuating the latest 9-11 conspiracy theory and actually having been in the Pentagon the day before and took three weeks to work out whether people I knew were still alive, I'm not prepared to tolerate that sort of nonsense. Yeah? Okay, so why do we need to do it? First of all, we need to move away from reactive analysis. In a complex adaptive system, you need fast, real-time feedback because the cost of amplifying success or dampening failure is lower the earlier you are in the process. Secondly, we've got an over-dependence in algorithms. Big data has huge value. The trouble is, I'm going through the third big data hype in my career. I've been through them. You know, there are advantages to being 16, not just discounted rail travel but the fact you've been through this stuff before. Right? Um, and fundamentally, we had it in the 80s with data warehousing. We had it around 9-11. I type, typify it as the one algorithm to rule them all and in the darkness bind them group. Right? Um, they genuinely believe if you're giving them enough money and time, they can write, write an algorithm which will predict the end of the universe. Right? This is probably where they're going fast quickly. Right? Now, there's nothing wrong with big data. It's hugely valuable. To give you an illustration, we're currently doing work in public transport by which people who actually are incentivized to tell a story as they enter and leave the transport system. Big data can tell you what journey they took. The story can tell you why they took the journey. And that's a big difference. Not only that, the story can be pictorial or oral. We don't rely on text. And we don't privilege people who write English because actually the algorithms privilege that as well. And also we can focus on outliers. So, Nothing wrong with big data, but taken to excess, and it's hyped hugely at the moment. Yeah? It's very dangerous. Yeah? People are spending a lot of money on things which aren't going to work. It's continuous real, I've made that point, free time looks the key. Now, some other factors. Anybody run focus groups or discussion groups or had people into a meeting? Okay, all the evidence is within 15 minutes is fundamentally biased by the facilitator. Yeah? No matter how good you are, that will happen. All right, so just live with it. Don't complain about this. Don't say your training prevents it, all right, because that's not true. Recognize that actually these techniques are really limited in what they can do. They're good for getting consensus, but consensus is the enemy of research because you scan less when you're seeking consensus than conflict. <coughs> yeah, we develop techniques for ritualizing conflict, which increases the amount of material scanned by 40 to 50%. Because in consensus, you don't scan as much because you're trying to focus on things you've got in common. And that can be really dangerous under conditions of uncertainty. Ethnographic techniques don't scale. Right? Anybody seen this point, this longitudinal research? Somebody gets a whole body of narrative, they transcribe the narrative, and then they spend six months tagging the data. Aside from the cultural bias, you can't scale those techniques to real time. I'm going through techniques which don't work to make a point here. And also questionnaires. 
All the evidence is a questionnaire, people know what the answer is meant to be. So they gift the answer or they gain the answer. Yet that's the way it works. So questionnaires, longitude research, ethnographic techniques, focus groups, all have inherent problems in them which actually are okay if it's complicated, but plain bloody danger if it's complex. So we need new techniques and new approaches. So that's what we've been working on. This is a concept of human metadata or human interpretation. It's based on the fundamental principle that the way we make sense of the world is through stories, but they're not the grand stories told in workshops where people know what story you want them to tell. They're the fragmented day-to-day -day stories of the school gate, the fire, the beer after work. It's the fragmented micro-narratives of day-to-day -day existence which determine the way we see the world. It also accounts, by the way, for massive cultural differences. I mean, I grew and went up to university in Britain in the 1970s. If you went to university in Britain in the 1970s, the issue wasn't whether you're on the left or right politically, but what type of Marxist were you and had you occupied the university yet this year? Yeah? I was leader of the Catholic Marxist-Leninist group. Nobody stood a chance against us. We had religious and political discipline. Yeah, we all went on to work for IBM and the security service, but never mind, this was the 70s. On the basis of that and going backwards and forwards across the wall in East Berlin in the latter part of the 70s, I can still distinguish between 15 types of Marxists based on a five-minute conversation in a bar late at night. <laughs> Something which has proved very useful in South Africa of late as well. I have memories of that period. Now, I now have people I work for in the States. If you told me I was going to work for them in the 70s, I would have had myself taken out and shot for the sake of the revolution. They think that Tony Blair is left-wing, which I find a strange idea. They also think he's a human being, which I find even stranger. And they can distinguish between 15 different varieties of the neoconservative religious right, which from my perspective is an amorphous mass which justifies the full reimposition of the Inquisition with all of its tools and instruments. <laughs> now, there's no genetic difference between us. The difference is the entrained patterns of the narratives in the society in which we grew up. And those narratives are fractal. They're self-similar, so they inherit. If you don't understand the narratives, you can't get anywhere. We're doing a huge project about to start one on peace, on peace negotiations. And we know that if we don't change people's past narratives, you can't create a future narrative. Until you change the past narrative so a new narrative becomes possible, you can't move forward. And you've got to change those fragmented day-to-day micro-narratives to achieve that. So, direct questions. Anybody done an employee satisfaction survey? You know that question? You know, does your manager consult you on a regular basis, scale of zero, not at all, 10 all the time? Everybody familiar with that one? Yeah. You know what the answer is, don't you? I remember phoning up IBM HR and saying, well, how do I answer this? I've got several managers. Some of them consult me, some of them do, some of them shouldn't, some of them shouldn't. And she said, average your experience over the year. And I say, you're a HR person working in research? Do you really think you've got the right job? That was a mistake, but never mind. I lit my brother. Uh, we take a different approach. Now, we basically get people, and this is a non-hypothesis approach. It's critical to do non-hypothesis research under uncertainty. We say, what's the story you tell your best friend if they're after a job in your work group? And we do this for 10% of the workforce every month because we don't want a big traumatic thing every year. We want something which is incidental and casual. We then say, in that story, where did the manager's attitude fit between behavior which was altruistic, assertive, or analytical? Now, notice those are three positive qualities, yeah? which means they can't be gained. They carry what's called necessary ambiguity, which means it engages the novelty receptive part of the brain, not the autonomic part. Because when people fill out a questionnaire, they're on automatic pilot, they're not thinking. When they don't know what the right answer is, you engage a different part of the brain, they think more deeply. And trade-offs are key. Normally in a project, there'll be six or seven of those. Now, that's the point. They're all positive, they're all negative, necessary ambiguity. And this also allows us then to do distributed ethnography. Remember I talked about my example of the young girls in Ethiopia? Well, let's take another one. We've got Roma kids who are acting as field ethnographers into Roma communities. Nobody's got anywhere near those communities before. They're getting straight in, they're capturing the data. People are interpreting their stories into, an eth into these frameworks. We're getting quantitative data coming back in real time with supporting anecdotal data. And kind of like just to illustrate this quickly, and I'm coming to the end of the stuff now, but this will just show you something on this. I've got to be careful what I show you on this. 
This was one actually in Libya. Yeah, this is actually looking at attitudes to justice. And you can see, I can go directly from the stories to actually the, from the raw data to the narrative. Yeah? Now, that's actually very exciting because I've got numbers backed up by narrative. And I don't mind what language I capture the stories in. And we capture pictures and oral text as well because the numbers give me statistical objectivity. The stories give me an explanation for what those statistics actually mean. I can show anybody more on that later, but that was an illustration of that. Now, one of the reasons we do that is this. Cognitive neuroscience has fallen out with radiographers over the years. I'm not sure why, but they conduct all their experiments on people who study x-rays. Uh, this is an example of that. Yeah? They actually put a gorilla by a cancer nodule, which was bigger than the gorilla, and people didn't spot it, even though they were looking at it. Where we've taken Roma stories indexed by Roma and presented them to Roma experts in Vienna, or stories told about sexuality in Africa and presented them to experts in Washington, we get strong correlations in both groups, but no correlation between the two. The expert interpretation is all instrumentalist about what needs to be done. The field definition is all descriptive about what's actually happening to people. Some difference is useful, but the level of difference is actually very high. So realizing that experts are fundamentally biased, and that's kind of like experimental data on that. And I didn't take that picture, by the way, just to be clear. Right? This is another example on culture scan. I won't go through that. This gets more exciting. This is actually looking at attitudinal measurement. Um, each of those little dots is a huge cluster of narrative. And it's basically starting to show overall patterns. Remember I said dispositions? What the landscape does is it shows the dispositions. Things will fall into hollows and slide off slopes. So it's not that we can't manage this stuff, but we manage, have to manage it in a different way. And then finally on this key principle called acceptive learning. Now, you don't know about acceptation, I would think. A dinosaur's feathers evolve for flight. No, they don't. They evolve for sexual display or warmth. Then they accept for flight. Yeah, so you can see how evolution happens. Feathers can evolve over time for something like warmth. But if every dinosaur kept throwing itself off trees in an attempt to fly, it would die. It couldn't breed. So it's actually only when feathers have developed to a certain extent does flight become possible. The cerebellum on your brain, which controls grammar in human language, evolved to manipulate muscles to pick seeds from seed pods. Human language couldn't have evolved naturally. It required acceptation. So this is an example, and this is stuff we're doing on health at the moment. On my left, I have stories about people's day-to-day -day lifestyle. On my right, I have lots of examples of technologies and cures and therapies which might work, both of which have been indexed on those triads independently of each other. Because what I want is novelty. What we then do is we mash the databases together in research terms or in real time, and we get, effectively, a set of clusters of where stories of my own health now start to cluster with ideas of cures. This is stuff we're now doing on diabetes prevention, because what I want is continual encounter of material which might make me think differently rather than a single course. <coughs> you are also planning, this is one of the UNDP projects, to actually create a database of things which have worked around the world, captured as fragmented stories, as you tell stories about a problem, they start to acceptably coalesce. So all of a sudden, you've got a non-structured, open method of integrating ideas rather than traditional taxonomies of knowledge management systems. And taxonomy doesn't just rhyme with taxidermy. It generally produces the same result. And of course, then we get stories without technologies and technologies without stories. So I promise to do a couple of issues. That's my leopard again. Sorry, I'm really proud of that leopard. That was uh, good stuff here. And that's it, picking the buck, buck, buck down from the Some things that we learn. First of all, we start a project and people phone us up and say, I've just read the stories. And you say, oh my God, I told you not to do that. The stories are explanations. They say they're not interpreting their stories properly. 80% of our clients say that first time around. How can they not interpret their stories properly? You've actually just learned that they see them differently from you. But that sort of expert entrainment is actually a major pattern. Secondly, making people objects, not subjects. There's far too much of that in the development community and in health. In allowing people to interpret their own stories puts them back in charge of their own stories. It doesn't make you in charge through your interpretation. But we still, still, people still want to do that in terms of the way it works. Making it look like another survey rather than moving into continuous capture. Yeah, that's a mistake. 
Not understanding abstraction and signifier design, people try and make the signifiers too precise rather than make them ambiguous. Yeah? Um, I'm doing this because there's another presentation coming this afternoon, so I promise to put these up. Seeking causality, not patterns. And then what I call the young alpha male syndrome. We've had this on one project. And young alpha males who care, who find new technologies, are really dangerous because now they think they own the interpretation and they know what's best for people. And we've had that two or three times, right? So there's a deliberate play on words in that, but it's kind of like problematic. So, to finish. I mentioned this yesterday, Goodhart's law. Any statistical regularity will collapse once pressure is placed upon it for control purposes. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a measure. Does this start to sound familiar? And then the really scary one. All the scientific evidence, without exception, says that when people are working for extrinsic rewards, it destroys intrinsic motivation. Yeah, that has major implications, because for God's sake, we need people intrinsically motivated to change the world, not actually working towards targets. We don't want the evils of industry transferring into government or the development sector. So kind of like, that's kind of like it. Yeah, new methods of research, new methods of thinking. Um, I did paint that picture in Marrakesh last week. That's a new camera. Um, if anybody wants to know more, kind of like we run training courses, and we've set up a special discount for anybody on the next two courses at this conference, yeah? Um, if anybody's in the development sector wants to use SenseMaker, we make it available at heavy discounts as well. Yeah. People like Boeing and Intel pay the higher fees, and you guys get it from that. What I've tried to do is explain there is a scientific approach to managing uncertainty. Trying to make an uncertain system appear it's causal means you, get make, you spend a lot of money making things worse. Recognizing the reality of different systems and recognizing our ability to move between them allows new possibilities to emerge but critically to empower people to be part of creating their own future rather than dependent on Western experts. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for that outstanding presentation. Fantastic. And then we have Chip Walker. If you want to. Uh, hope everybody can hear me. Dave, can I ask you to move one seat over that way? <laughs> And I could ask the rest of the panel to, to come on up. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chip Walker. I'm with uh, USAID, and I have the pleasure of serving as a moderator, both for uh, initially for a bit of a discussion uh, with some folks that I'm going to introduce uh, to you in just a minute. Uh, and then we'll go on and have uh, some time for some for, uh, question and answers. So uh, the, this group that uh, just joined us on the stage um, could very well have uh, each of them uh, offered a keynote address uh, in their own right. Uh, each of them has been doing very interesting uh, work. You have their uh, bio material uh, in, uh, in your books. Uh, but uh, 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 Sonal uh, is uh, currently working, has had a, a diverse uh, career both in the private and public sectors, currently working as a, uh, running a, a very interesting new center at Georgetown University. Uh, Steve Waddell. Uh, has been uh, working uh, also on issues of, of complexity for many years, has recently been doing some consulting with the World Bank. Um, and uh, lastly, we have uh, Bruce uh, Waltuck, who's spent a, a long career uh, inside various parts of the uh, U.S. federal government, primarily working on domestic, uh, and domestic programs, uh, but has recently uh, uh, taken on a responsibility of working on organizational learning and supporting clients as a uh, president of a non-governmental organization. So we also have heard from Dave. He gave, a, uh, gave us a lot of material to, to chew on this morning. And I think what we'd like to use this panel discussion for is to ask uh, for our experts to sort of help, uh, from their own perspective, interpret and sort of emphasize certain of the messages. And I guess the, the one that I, perhaps everybody is saying, based on what Dave is looking at, is like if you were trying to give like one or two points that you would want people to take away from this discussion going back to the, what one or two things would you say the implications of this are that you would really would like them to sort of think a little bit more about? So now, since you're here, would you <laughs> start with you? Um, well, first of all, I, it's, a, it's a great conversation because I think um, we tend to want to normalize everything in life. And normalization it just lets you know that nothing is that normal on a daily basis. So it's good, it's good to remember on a regular basis. I think the challenge that we face, and just for speaking from a policymaking side, is that 
So much stuff is coming at you all the time that you're trying to find at least some patterns and you're not sure you have the tools to do it. So I, I take away thinking about how do we train people to think this way, not just how do we put the systems in place uh, to allow people to let the system work that way. And I don't know, I work at a university right now, I don't know that we train anyone to think about complexity. I think we try to teach everyone to think about the norm. And, um, and maybe the sciences do, but certainly the social sciences don't, and more and more people are going through that. So I walk away thinking, how do we start training people within government? How do we start training people within universities and students that are coming out? How do we help people think through complexity in general and make sense of complexity? But I do think we need to have some tools that are simple enough for people to use, because I listen to this, and I'm willing to listen, but I can't imagine a student listening through the whole conversation and staying through that right now, but how do, we, how do people in a rapid situation, when I was in government, the press was coming at you 24 seven. How do you deal with making decisions in that complication on a daily basis when people want an answer yesterday, not today, not a week from now? Steve, what would you like to add to that? Um, well, I uh, have been a fan of Dave's framework for many years, so I'm a bit biased, but I did recently uh, do an analysis looking at a variety of large system change frameworks. So large system change, whole system change, uh, transformation, transitions management, uh, wicked problems, etc. And in that uh, review, um, I ended up um, concluding uh, the particular value of Dave's framework because it's comprehensive, right? As he used, he likes the word multi-ontological. But what it means is that you can actually um, look at a comprehensive sense-making field, and he explains what is not complex as well as what is complex. Um, and out of that arise a lot of interesting observations for me. For instance, uh, we were, I was doing some work in South Africa around water and sanitation systems. And there was a consortium formed of a half dozen um, organizations. Most of them um, uh, were uh, engineering firms, and one was a social development agency. So the social development organization was about building the community's capacity to be able to take charge of the actual uh, construction project, and so they would be capable at the end in terms of running the project, et cetera, or, or managing it. Well, um, this is a great example of where you put a complicated frame, overarching framework around a complex issue, right? So um, the, uh, the uh, institutional development, the societal development uh, folks went out to the community. Uh, the community couldn't make up their mind about something, uh, 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 and they went back and reported this to the consortium. The consortium said, you're not doing your job properly. You haven't met the PERT, light, uh, pert chart um, timeframe goals. And so this was the way that the complicated was trying to control the complex. Now, a very different story about that is with some work that I saw USAID doing actually in Madagascar quite a few years ago, and it was around road building. And in that case, they, put the, the, they focused upon organizing the community and having the community development process be in charge of deciding who was going to be the road builder. And so the community got to experiment with different approaches, and it was the community that was the driver for the action. So they went through, you know, they experienced the complexity of the development process, uh, um, which I think Dave has given a, a, a great um, description of. Um, so it's about the relationship between the two, I think, that also emerges from Dave's work. And then you come into the question of uh, what are the tools or the methods and approaches that should be used for each situation, right? Because the simple uh, uh, versus, or the obvious versus the complicated versus the complex versus the chaotic um, versus the disorder all require different tools and approaches. And we all know the syndrome of uh, I've got a tool and it's a hammer and that's a nail. And what, we're, what I'm trying to do is actually be engaged in building people's sophistication about the range of tools that are involved 
for these different types of situations and the implicit implications of using one tool in, a, in the wrong type of situation because people simply haven't been um, shown the difference and the implication of uh, the difference between tools and the implications of using them in terms of their usefulness for these different frameworks. Bruce, I just want everybody to take a note of uh, Bruce's shoes. Uh, he's, wearing his, <laughs> he's wearing his disruptive sneakers today. So they are the honor. shoes of disruption. Those of you who have been following on Twitter will have seen them yesterday. <laughs> um, thanks. So um, to me, and I, I have spent many years inside of public organizations, most recently in an organization as senior advisor to the administrator of an agency in HHS that gives three billion a year in grants for mental health services and substance abuse prevention and treatment. And many of the same kinds of challenges uh, occur, uh, are co-occurring, HIV AIDS, homelessness, criminal justice system, and so on, as represent the kinds of challenges I hear in the stories I've been listening to out in the corridors here. This understanding that not all of your challenges are the same kind of problem, working in the same kind of way, and that there are optimal ways of responding, depending on the type of problem that you're dealing with, is critical in terms of optimizing your likelihood or probability of a successful outcome. The big problem that I see and that I saw when I worked at SAMHSA, and we were making these grants, and I assume that this is a phrase that many or all of you know, is this buzzword of evidence-based practice. If I'm going to give you a million dollars, I want to know what you're going to do with it, and then I want fidelity. I want to know, did you do what you said you were going to do the way you said you were going to do it? Implicit or explicit in that is the presumption that the causality, the relationship between what you're going to do and what you're going to get is known and knowable. And yet the reality is it tends not to be because these are complex problems. You simply cannot and do not know right now, you can't know enough, as Dave said, to necessarily guarantee that the intervention you undertake is going to yield the result that everybody's expecting. And so what happens is we fall into this pattern of the way the RFPs are written and the way the uh, uh, things are implemented out in the field. And, and there's goals and there's measures because we have to go to Congress and all they understand are simple things anyway. And so we, we get caught up in this trap of, and cycle of how we do what we do in terms of this. And we do not get the result we anticipated. And so we scratch our heads and we get involved in blame. And the underlying issue is fear because we don't want to admit that there's this level of uncertainty or ambiguity. We don't want to be embarrassed by admitting we don't know exactly what the answer is or what it is that we should do, but we have to do something. I heard a great story this morning. Uh, Roberto was telling out in the, in, uh, outside about a program, and forgive me, I forget where this was done, but it was a nation that said, we need jobs. And so, all right, we'll create jobs, and we'll have girls that will sell flowers. Well, what happened? The critical factors of context and culture were not accounted for. This notion of benchmarking, if we just do what they did over there the way they did it over there, we'll get what they got. And they didn't. And the story was there was competition. The flowers that we're selling for here, my flowers are just as good. And why aren't I getting what they're getting? And there was competition and there was tension and there, were, there was not the success in the outcome that was intended. This is a new way forward. This is the lens by which I believe that science tells us not just opinion tells us, science tells us, this is what's really going on. And therefore, it's incumbent, I think, on everyone here to understand, to learn, to be disrupted in this new way and adopt this new kind of thinking and practice. I mean, I, I, your Kinevin framework has been around for, for several years. And I mean, I think it's um, whether people have heard about it particularly or just the the general sort of observation that uh, there are different kinds of problems out, out there and that they needed to be addressed in different kinds of ways using different kinds of tools. I guess, you know, to, to one degree or another, each of you has sort of been grappling with this question about how do we 
sort of overcome some of the sort of the, the reliance on sort of tried and true reductionism, Newtonian types of linear approaches and so forth. And I guess my question is, is you know, if we're trying to make some collective progress on this, where, where would you sort of point to in terms of uh, trying to move the, the collective effort forward? I mean, is it, as Sanan was perhaps implying, that we need to change the way that we um, educate folks at the, in, in, in universities, or is it earlier than that? I mean, Peter w yesterday was sort of suggesting we need to blow up the way we do uh, education up until, up, up through high school, um, get it off an assembly line. But um, I'm just sort of wondering where you, where you would sort of put your, your, your efforts. Dave, we'll start with you, if you don't mind. Okay, a couple of things on that. I profoundly disagreed with Peter yesterday. Um, I mean, I think, partly because I don't think education came from an industrial production line. Education came from classics. It comes from the 13th, 14th century. Yeah, if you actually look at it, and I think we've lost some of that. I agree on that. But what we've lost is the ability to create generalists, people who are intellectually curious. And we need to go back to that. I actually don't think it's difficult to teach this stuff. I mean, I do one-week courses about five universities around the world, and they're popular courses. Because students come in knowing that the world is uncertain. Yeah, they haven't yet been pattern entrained into, into deterministic research methods. And I mean, there's a famous video which actually shows students passing a basketball and people don't see a gorilla that passes through the middle. Mm -hmm. And I showed that to a group of sociologists in Melbourne, which is cruel. Philosophers tend to be cruel towards sociologists on broad principle, right? And none of them saw it. And eventually, after we showed it 13 times and I pointed out the gorilla, and they claimed I'd faked it and I had to prove it was the same video. One of them said, that just disproves every research method we teach our students. Yeah? And I think that's the level of profundity we've got. And we've now got about 50 PhD students using SenseMaker worldwide. And we're about to launch a program by which universities can have it for free if they set up some investment. Because I think the momentum is now switching. People are facing situations where they know the world is uncertain. Yeah? And it comes into this issue about how do you make decisions under pressure. The driver for this was somebody, I didn't know who he was until after I really decided to like him, and that was Admiral John Poindexter. So after an hour's conversation, I suddenly discovered this guy was Reagan's national security advisor, and as a Welsh socialist, I meant to dislike him, but I think he's brilliant and he's a good friend. And he said when he was NSA, every time he asked for an opinion, the agencies competed not to tell him what he needed to know, but to actually have their advice accepted. Yeah. Right? And I've checked since subsequently with other NSAs, that's a continuation. So the challenge he gave us back in DARPA days, and this was immediately after 9-11, yeah, where it was you know, really important, was how does an NSA go from an abstract representation of the total space to the raw intelligence data without any mediating layers of interpretation? And that's what those landscapes do. They have allowed a huge volume of data to be presented as a visual landscape in which the outliers and patterns are visible. And then the decision maker can click on that and read the narrative. Now we're finding at a senior decision making level that transforms things. Because all of a sudden they're no longer reliant on interpretation. They've got statistical validity, explanatory type narrative. So I think it's by taking on intractable or difficult problems, the ones that conventional methods haven't solved, by creating tools that make reality visible to decision makers, rather than allowing them to hide behind interpretations and reports, that's how you achieve change. Do you, anyone else get, care to add things that you think would, would be ways well, to move this forward? Uh, well, um, I'm engaged in an effort right now, uh, which I'm looking to engage Dave in um, uh, more deeply as well. Uh, Dave has uh, a real insight and great value in this area. Uh, the report work I did with the USAID or with World Bank was around looking at the world of this type of thinking. And you can see that there's similar approaches that are emerging in multiple areas. In the environmental area, uh, there's a lot of work being done around resilience, adaptation, et cetera, which is also embracing complexity thinking. In uh, some of this work that's called transitions management, which is more in the um, how do we uh, move through paradigms, et cetera, uh, as well uh, systems thinking. Uh, we know that it is happening in uh, a number of fields. 
And so the particular effort that I see is necessary is to bring together some of the great um, uh, work that's being done in these fields to create uh, a collective um, effort around the diversity about developing the, and uh, l learning how to use the diversity of methodologies that are available, further advancing them, taking on key issues such as um, mindsets of funders and granting agencies um, by giving them a, a non-fragmented message. Right now, there's a very fragmented message when people are all um, trying to say something very similar about the need to look at complexity. So um, that's one effort that I'm uh, uh, focusing on right now to build the uh, sort of the profile and the capacity uh, to be able to work in complex issue arenas. I guess I'm just struggling. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, um, I understand it. I intellectually understand the complexity argument. I agree with the majority of it. I don't actually buy that we care that's true even if you intellectually get it, and if the, everyone at the top believes it, it doesn't get interpreted down when you're the person trying to implement something. And I do think that the World Bank can say all it wants, but when you get down to the country level, that's not the way the system actually works. And I feel like we're having an intellectual argument as to what can be done versus what actually happens on the ground and what actually gets implemented. And I'm trying to figure out how to square these two. Like, how do you take the macro to the micro at the very bottom up approach? On one hand, in development, we're all talking about bottom up approach stuff. On the other hand, these are all top down approaches that you're trying to say this is how the system should work and then the system should work that way. And I'm struggling with how those two come together. And then the last bit I'd make is, Dave, I agree. I think the defense agencies, I think the science agencies have the money to think about these things. I don't think the social services agencies have any money to think about these things. And frankly, it's not the way the system's working, at least in the United States. Can I just, just add, I mean, I, this is you know, my own personal, I mean, I, I think the point you make is, 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 is an important one, but and I think Dave, Dave said this earlier. To me, the big issue is, is essentially people are ready to embrace this when they realize that the tools that they have just don't work. There was a big surge of interest in USAID around these issues when we had officers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. The traditional models, the, the planning processes and so forth when that they were taking with them out there just fell apart right away. And they would say, well, what do we do? You know, and at that point, we didn't really have much of a way of an, of an answer um, because uh, we really weren't thinking much in these terms. And so it was really that drive that sort of created, and then we, we, we actually organized in, a couple of years ago a complexity event to sort of help people understand whether or not the kinds of ideas that Dave and others have been pushing was really something that people wanted to work on. And that was sort of the seeds of it. So I, I mean, I just go back to that point, is that at least for people who are trying to support change, it's when they realize that what they, what the the methods that they have don't really work very well, that they're open to looking for other things. And that's when these kinds of ideas are well, I think possible. Th th there's an important qualification here because I live that problem every day. Yeah. Right? And one of the problems you've got, and let me give an illustration. In the British Health Service, I was one of a series of experts consulted by Lord Darcy, who was then a minister. Yeah, so his goal is to, is to reform the NHS, and we don't have death tribunals. I'm still recovering from Sarah Palin, right? But, yeah, we need reform. So, and I then discover every expert has been given 15 minutes, which means you're not really being consulted, your name has just been added to a list, right? So I go in and if you don't know it, Darcy is an oncologist, so he's actually a doctor and also a politician. And he's just had three days of suffering social science people giving him 15 minute summaries. So my all out savage attack on sociology went down wonderfully. <laughs> 15 minutes became three hours. More and more senior civil servants started to arrive. And we'd worked a controlled trial by which we'd have gone into six hospitals, and this is stuff we do a lot of now. So patients, we keep continuous narrative throughout the hospital journey. So we could replace 56 different outcome-based targets which were costing 10% of a hospital's budget with a single low-cost measurement system. Over the next two weeks, the civil service destroyed it because they were measured on overall targets and they could make sure they always achieved their targets if they gave targets out to the hospitals. If we move to 
out what are called impact targets. Remember those triangles? Mm -hmm. You say, at the moment, you've got 5% of your stories in the middle. I want 20% at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. That's ungameable. And they were scared, lived, scared shitless by the prospect to be measured on performance rather than the manipulation of targets. So it's a real issue. Yeah? The way I've found that does work is as you increase evidence from the field and as you give capability. So, for example, we're about to start a controlled test in Wales, which is going to be replicated in New Zealand. We're looking for US partners, in which we're going to get schools in a discrete area to go into the community every month to gather stories about what's working or not working in those communities indexed at the point of origin. Yeah? Controlled test, academic supervision. Yeah? Now, we know that when we start to present that to politicians, it means we can trigger alerts to politicians to say there's a cluster of stories here which are negative. Do you want to go and do something about it? Because allowing politicians to do something quickly about a small problem is much more attractive than talking about big solutions which take time. Yeah? And what we will prove over the course of six months is that we can save the Welsh Assembly a seven-figure sum in market research by using citizens as effectively a feedback mechanism. And then we can allow them to ask a question of those citizens in real time to resolve a policy conflict. So we move into scalable, demonstrable capability, which removes the middle layers between the decision maker and the people. Because the middle layers are the ones with all of the investment in preventing that happening. And I think that's where the radical change comes. The good news is that at the moment, teachers in schools in the US and the UK alike are rewarded for filling out learning plans and getting pupils to conform with learning plans. They're not rewarded for inspiring kids to learn. With these type of systems, you can reward that. Right? And I think that's, that's why its moment has come, because the level of frustration with explicit targeting is at an all-time high, and the people suffering are the people on the ground and the decision makers. Yeah? They're the ones with the pain, not the bureaucrats. So you connect the two together, I think that's how we change. But, I mean, is it fair to say, though, that in those cases where you've been making those inroads, that uh, it hasn't really been necessary to sort of go and, and tell a senior decision maker that there is this four or five part world out there and that they're really no, sort of stuck in? I mean, you, you saw me play with the iPad there. Mm -hmm. you, you, you give a senior decision maker, and I just did it with the board of an international company in Marrakesh, all right? But we got stories from their staff, we gave them that. They, they spent hours on it. The ability to go directly from numbers to stories engages people. And to give an example, General Sorensen, who was the old th three-star in charge of IT for the US Army uh, until recently, um, he was one who, I mean, I got thrown out of the Pentagon, not by him specifically, right, some years ago. But I didn't get thrown out. It was indicated I should leave, right? Because I said the US Army had the best method I knew for knowledge capture. They captured stories in the field under fire. But the worst method I knew for knowledge distribution they synthesized them through trial drug into best practice and doctrine. Then I got called back three years later. Yeah, and I, li I like generals because if things go wrong, they don't mind saying they went wrong, and you get called back. And they said, the only thing which worked in Iraq was platoon commanders blogging. Nobody paid attention to doctrine. Because people, if they can have access to stories, understand them. They don't understand summarization and abstraction. Yeah? So again, from that, we got a project with West Point, which has just been published in Soldier magazine, which is starting to allow people to share and distribute stories, because in practice, that makes a difference to them. And I think the essence of this, all complexity work, is about, is about acting in the world to see what's possible. It, it's not reflective, it's not aggregative, it's not reductionist. So you do small projects fast, you give feedback, you directly connect with decision makers, and you resist, you try and move people into continuous capture. Because the minute they can see how they can reinforce a small change or disrupt a small change, they get excited. At the moment, everything is too big, everything is too difficult. You want to say something? And then we're going to need to get some questions. Um, so what I would add to this is the notion that, and Dave talks about safe to fail uh, trials or experiments of promising ideas. One way that perhaps you can ease into this it's not an either or anyway, it's, it's always both and. There is some stuff that falls, that, that the kind of things that you're used to doing and the ways that you're used to doing it, and other things that are not and need to be changed. But can you fearlessly explore? Can you devote some percentage of your resources to trying things in these new and different ways? 
Because if you do, you will see that this works. And if it works, people will like it, and it will attract more attention, and thereby more resources, and, and the knowledge will spread. There's an example. I've been working on a book with a colleague for a couple of years about the dynamics and patterns of disruptive experience. Um, I didn't know uh, until very recently that I was going to be here with you all and that, that this theme was, was going to be about disruption. But perhaps the best metaphor that we know that we're using throughout the book, is there anyone here who has ever surfed? Oh, I, I, I rarely get that, but there's a few people who do that. Well, you learn how to surf, and you all can, can tell, could speak to it directly. But what we have read about uh, in, in this is you can watch other people do this, you can, you, know, you can read all the books you want, but you've got to go out and get on that wave. And the waves are not the same every time, and they will be unpredictable, and there will be uncertainty. And if you get knocked down, um, or hopefully you will get up and you will try again. And, and, and it is that journey and that repetition of trying and doing and learning that is critical to act into this kind of uncertainty. So learn to surf these waves of uncertainty and disruption. Know that there are going to be waves that will knock you on your tail. It's okay because that is the way the world works. It isn't going to succeed every time. But you can learn as much, if not more, per perhaps, from what didn't work. The other piece is this continuous readjustment. Uh, don't start with the theory. This is what we think is going on. You can learn from what you can find out from these kinds of stories and narrative fragments. Let that inform you. Instead of this big buzzword of evidence-based practice, take a look at the countervailing movement of practice-based evidence. If you're not familiar with that, or if you're not familiar with Michael Quinn Patton's work on developmental evaluation, I suspect that some are, many not. But if you're not, take a look at that. It's all rooted and grounded in this. There's a GAO study that came out about a year ago about federal agencies and the small percentage that use any evaluative methods, never mind developmental. Of those who do, a very smaller percentage, I think it was about 16% of maybe 30%, use what they learn along the way to drive change and improvement. Sometimes you've got to reset the compass. Sometimes your theory isn't right and it doesn't fit the reality. Are you going to keep doing the same thing over and over again? You know what that's called. <laughs> yes. Um, I think we have a few minutes to, to open it up more generally, to enlarge the conversation. If any of you have questions or comments that you'd like to share, I see that there are some microphones there, and we would encourage you to do it. I think I, if we can, uh, we'll take one or two. And if we have some feedback from uh, anyone who's doing the live streaming, we'll, we'll try to take those questions as well. Yes, ma'am, please. Yes, I have a question for Dave. It seems to me, well, there's two questions. Question number one might be simple. Um, you made the example of using constraints or playing with constraints to move from complicated to complex. Could you give a little example of that? Um, OK, let, let me, I'll give you one. We did a, a big project on Aboriginal health in um, Broken Hill. and. I mean, there are major political background issues. I mean, some of my first developmental work in the 70s was on <laughs> Aboriginal land rights. Yeah? And if you don't know it, Aboriginals were only classified as human beings from 1967 onwards on the census. Before that, they were classified as flora and fauna, which tells you something about the world. Yeah? So we ran a workshop. We identified, I think, 14 safe-to-fail experiments, things like busing people to an area um, making sure that people from the community killed and cooked the meat in accordance with sacred traditions. There were, all of the experiments were coherent. Not everybody agreed with all of the experiments, but they agreed they were all coherent, and that's a key principle on conflict resolution. Yeah? What then happened is the experiments ran for two months, and then as the experiments ran, some succeeded or some failed. The ones which succeeded got more resource. The ones which failed had resource taken away from them. Some got combined. And and one of the fun things on that, we ended up with a whole, but we ended up with a huge amount of meat killed and cooked in accordance with sacred tradition. We were trying to change dietary habits. Um, so there's now a restaurant in Broken Hill where you can eat milk killed and cooked in accordance with sacred tradition. It will cost you three times as much as a kangaroo steak in Sydney. <laughs> 
So I claim to have invented anthrotourism to go with ecotourism, right? But the principle is, as things started to work, people put more resource or took constraints away, added the constraints. If it then carried on working, it then became a formal program. If it didn't work, we pulled it back, pulled it back to the experimental level. Thank you. My next question is this. It seems to me that there is a dilemma in what you're saying. Um, I, I think there's a real breakthrough in what you said, and others have said this, that the, it's the interaction, it's the space between two people talking that actually is what's yes. real. <laughs> not, it's not that I'm talking from my head to your head and then from your head to my, there's something in between the space out here is where it's happening. But then when you capture individual narratives, you're capturing the monologue, not the dialogue. And I'm curious about that. Well, first of all, you have to remember, I've got a physics background, and physics, physics grows up with paradoxes, not dilemmas. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah? um, so we know that general relativity theory and quantum mechanics contradict each other, but they both work. So paradox I'm comfortable with. Right? The reality is the stories that people tell are an emergent property of their interactions over time and the way they interpret them are their perception on those interactions. And remember, we're not looking at individual stories, that's what the quant researchers do. We're looking at the patterns of a multiple stories. So for example, one of the projects we did in Pakistan with distributed ethnography, we ended up with, I think, 50,000 stories gathered in a week, yeah, over multiple agencies with effectively, I think, 30,000 respondents. Yeah? Now the patterns you see in that number are patterns of the system as a whole, not actual patterns which are particular. Because you're only looking at patterns over large volumes, you're not looking at patterns over individual items. Thank you. Anyone else? And do we have anything that's come in over from the, from the live streaming that we want to take into account? I have a question. Um, so uh, this is Debbie Prindle. I work with Chip on um, project design training for USAID. And we're in the process now of trying to use a three-day workshop to introduce more of a local systems lens into, um, into the training. So I'm intrigued by Dave saying this can be done in a week in terms of at least the complexity part of, of the discussion this morning, training that. Um, and I wonder if you could give us a couple, just in a nutshell, a couple of the key techniques or principles that make it possible to, to do that so rapidly with a group. Okay. I think critically you need to use metaphors. Um, me metaphors, metaphors and antonyms, right? So human beings evolve, and if, if you don't know it, the history of human language Symbolic art emerged before language in humans. It's, it's unique to us, it's not common to anthropo to any, any apes or any Cretaceans. So the cave paintings you see come before language. So human language evolved from abstractions of the world, which is why it's as sophisticated as it is. And we naturally think in metaphors. Yeah? So for example, the children's party story, which I didn't perform today, but you can look at on YouTube, and you can see me 35 kilograms heavier in that. I'm going to have to re-record that one, right? It's embarrassing now. <laughs> um, that has gone viral, right? Because everybody gets it. You're making a metaphor between different types of ways of managing a party. Everybody can understand that, yeah? Antonyms are particularly successful. Complicated, complex, efficiency, effective. Make a difference between two things that people have previously seen as the same thing, yeah? Um, the other thing in operational use, Kinevin is defined by narratives from the organization itself, not from the same group of American manufacturing companies that all other cases are drawn from. So we define the domains and we define the boundary conditions by narrative that everybody understands, which means that argument is now easier. Yeah? It's like these, it's not like those. So you're situating it in narrative. Right? The other technique which I strongly recommend is something called ritual descent, and the forms and the method for this are public. So we'll get people to find an intractable problem. Public transport is generally a good one, by the way. Everybody's got frustrations with public transport. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, right? Um, and you get people to construct safe to fail experiments, and we have forms for people to fill out on that to make sure they do everything properly. 
And so you might have five tables around the room, and each, to each table produces a safety failure experiment. They then send a spokesman to the next table. Yeah, so you rotate. The spokesman presents the complete silence for four minutes. Then they put on a mask. They're now not allowed to say anything, explain anything, or justify anything. And the team launch an all-out savage, unprincipled attack on the idea. They're, not, they're told not to be nice, not to be pleasant, not to be favorable. And then the person goes back, having been savaged. They revise the proposal. You repeat that four times. Yeah. What comes out of that is robust beyond belief. Uh, everybody enjoys it. New age fluffy bunnies get all upset about this until they see it in practice. But the end, sorry, it's my favorite hashtag, all right? Um, the reality is that Gary Klein and I did experiments on this. The amount of data scanned after four rounds of ritual descent before people make a decision is five times what they scan at the start. Yeah? Consensus reduces the amount of data scan. Yeah? And what you're showing there is, and, you know, I do a lot of work on conflict resolution, because once you realize the world is complex, you know there isn't a solution that you can know yet. And that's enormously liberating. Therefore, actual, what we call ritual descent, is a technique to show people diversity. So, for example, as I was in Marrakesh, I was working with the board of one of the world's top fashion brands. They got terribly confused by the lecture, but then we did ritual descent the next day, and they just all came up with, now we get it. Yeah. Lots, of, lots of input, lots of sources, manage uncertainty, don't try and eliminate uncertainty, move forward. And there's, there's other stuff. I mean, we, our methods are public, all right? Um, the key thing is to engage people in action, engage them in metaphor, and you've got to change their language. The minute somebody says, you know, use, use ordinary language, don't use jargon, you know they don't want to learn. Right? As, as Heidegger famously said, man thinks he's the master of language, language is the master of man. If you don't pay people, change people's language, you don't change the way they think. Any other questions? I, wanted to, I just wanted to ask one. You, you, in passing in the very beginning, you were, you were making a distinction between um, systems mm. and complexity. I was wondering if you could, uh, but you, you call uh, some systems complex and adaptive. So I guess I'd like to understand a little bit more about what, how you sort of see this distinction between sort of systems on the one hand and complexity on the other. Well, I think I'm making a distinction between systems thinking. And I'm also saying, in, in, in practical terms, systems thinking now means systems dynamics. Uh, if you actually look at the literature, you look at the practice. Right? And what I want to do is I want to make a distinction because I want people to understand the key, the key difference. Right? And the key difference for me is causality, non-causality. So if you look at systems thinkers, and Peter Senge is a good example of this, yeah? they define a future state and they try and close the gap. Complexity thinkers focus on describing the present identifying what we can change, out of the things that we can change, where can we monitor the impact of that change, and out of the things where we could monitor the impact, where could we amplify success or dampen failure. So complexity thinkers work in what we call the situated now. We, we manage the evolutionary potential of the present. We don't try and define design to a future state. That's why it's an ecological approach, not an engineering approach. And I, I do find it quite disturbing. A lot of the systems, Meg Wheatley does the same thing. She uses the language, but she's still defining an ideal future state. Yeah, and I understand that it was a necessary thing to go through. It was a transitionary thing for two or three decades. It was important, but now we need to move on. And non, thinking in non-causal ways, working effectively with propensities and dispositions. Yeah, propensities innate quality of the things, dispositions current state. That's the big change, and that's huge. But, but even with that complexity, you have an end that you're trying, I mean, you're trying no. to make an improvement in public no, you, educa no, education. The, no, you do it differently, all right? You, you, you never set a precise goal, right? I mean, one of the things we, we increasingly use are heuristics. Yeah? Because heuristics, and heuristics are different from principles. So if you look at the Marines, if the battlefield plan breaks down, they fall back to three heuristics, capture the high ground, stay in touch, keep moving. Now the point about heuristic is I can measure compliance, it's not subject to interpretation, whereas a principle or a value is too subject to interpretation, but it can manage conditions of extreme uncertainty. 
So actually, and we also use parable form stories because if you're all the major world religions, all of them, you know, not just the three religions of the book, but you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, all use parable form stories. And parables are paradoxical stories which don't set out specific lessons, but they provide direction. So in complexity, you gain a sense of direction, but you never set a goal or a pathway to achieve it. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I did, uh, if I may. Um, with regard to, again, this notion about distinctions between systems thinking, perspectives, and complexity, um, Peter mentioned it, and if you look at traditional literature on systems thinking stuff, um, it uses metaphor and language that is mechanical in its, in its literal nature, the, the notion of levers, uh, which I think Peter did use that word yesterday. Um, and I've seen Peter speak before, and that's consistent with his background in, in systems thinking and his training. And this is the notion, you know, as, as we talk about, for hundreds of years, we've developed a primarily Newtonian view of the world. We've achieved an awful lot. We went to the moon using that kind of knowledge. These are not that sort of problem, the things that you all are dealing with. They're not that way. And so, what complexity teaches us is that it isn't an either or, it's a both and, and there is a different kind of underlying dynamic. It's the same way that physics advanced in the last century to tell us about quantum dynamics and relationships. In physics, they talk about particles that have resonant coupling. I can take a little subatomic thing over here, put the other piece half a world away, and this has been done, and the minute I change and flip one, the other immediately responds. Human beings do this too, as the question earlier was about. That the stories are about what is between us, not just what is in us. What complexity gives us is a better way, a more accurate way to understand what is really going on. And if the more we know about what's really going on, the better we can respond and the better probability of a successful outcome that we intend. So uh, I would just like to ask Dave, um, the way that I have found uh, systems uh, approaches useful is um, not treating them as predictive tools, but treating them as tools for uh, broadening discussion and imagination and potential. So when you were talking about um, the uh, value of the sense of direction, um, I think that the range of senses of direction can be uh, enriched by uh, the, the sense of the range, uh, the array of senses of direction can be enriched through um, some of these tools. I th I th and I wouldn't object to that, all right? So if, if you look at the differences between myself and Ralph Stacey, Stacy rejects all systems thinking. I actually say it has huge utility in a complicated domain. Right? But that's why I want to make the distinction. Um, and I actually think we need to get rid of some aspects of systems thinking, like the obsession with values and behavior. I mean, any, it's one on one anthropology. The minute you write your values down, you just lost them. You know, so anybody who writes down a value statement or a mission statement just doesn't understand anthropology. You just tell people what language to use on every document they write. Yeah? And you've created an explicit culture which people will gain rather than dealing with what's called the ideation culture, the way we do things around here which we understand but we can't explain which is revealed through narrative. So I think it comes back to what was, you know, Bruce said. Fundamentally, engine engineering approaches have dominated systems thinking. You look at, you look at the origin of Senge's work in Forrester, yeah? they also model. And you know you're meeting a systems thinker when you have boxes with arrows with feedback loops. Because and the, some of the Santa Fe guys are the same thing. Yeah, they, they, they want to abstract things into a model. Now, if you go back to Mary Gilman, famously said, the only valid model of a human system is the system itself. What we're trying to do with narrative is get the system to model itself to decision makers in real time in a way which can be interpreted. Because the minute you move into a model, the model creator controls the outcome. Uh, and that's actually really dangerous. And I think most systems thinkers work, on, work as model creators, which is why they can work under situations of high constraint, but why their approaches are dangerous 
when you move into a complex space. Can I ask a question? Because I'm, I'm trying to figure this out, which is like, in many ways, communities have this intuition already. Like, they probably think in complex systems on a constant basis, individuals, as individuals, we're constantly taking yeah. in different amounts of information and making decisions based on that. Is it that when, when we try to scale and when organizations get big or you're trying to run larger, complex systems themselves, we don't know how to use the judgments and the intuitions and the data the way we used to yeah. or that way we do on a normal basis? Or is it that um, it's just more complex and we need a whole new system to figure this out? So I'm just trying to figure out where that is. No, I, th I, th I was going to say that's a good question, but I made that mistake in Australia once. And this guy <laughs> turned to me and said, I didn't ask you to rate my question, you probably bastard. I asked you to answer it, right? Um, which is, I share that because it's a good put down, right? Only an Australian could have come up with that. I think there are two or three things. Um, sorry, I shouldn't go down these side digressions. Um, just repeat quickly. Sorry? <laughs> just, 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 oh, right, so, so intuition. If, if you look at, I mean, Larry Prusak once, I, mean, I remember when I worked with Larry, he said intuition is compressed experience. Yeah? Um, and this is the appalling thing about Malcolm Gladwell's blink. Yeah, what, what Gladwell does is he has a thesis which he know will sell and he selects the example which back up that thesis, right? Academia. Yeah, no, it's, well, it's not. It's, it's, it's what's become what I would call the guru market. It's like, um, it's like anti-fragility or whatever it's called, which is actually just a subset of resilience. But, you know, instead of building on the body of literature so we can change things, the desire is to create something which can market for a short period of term, right? So that's problematic. I think there's two things about intuition. Intuition built through apprentice systems has huge value. And we've destroyed apprentice models of management. Yeah, and that's something we've got to bring back, right? Because managers have got to exercise judgment. The other thing about what I call distributed cognition is that's how you handle intuition. You have a huge sense in that work, making decisions independently in real time. Then you can master intuition because you can produce objective statistical data to convince decision makers. All right, well, it looks like uh, we've come to the end of this very interesting session. We've, we've toured through great uh, literatures of philosophy, anthropology, cognitive science, and so forth. I hope you, this has been sufficiently disruptive to your, to your mornings. I think we're, we're scheduled for a bit of a, of a break so you can um, uh, try to make some sense of it. And please, by all means, uh, uh, do talk uh, further uh, to any of the panelists. I'm sure they, they all have very interesting experiences and additions to share with you. So thank you to Dave for a very stimulating conversation. Thank you to, the, to Bruce, to Steve, and to Sanal for uh, adding to the conversation. Uh, thanks. thanks so much.